Brought to you by World of Warships! What can be said about Enzo Ferrari that hasn't already been said? How many articles, books, and even other YouTube videos have started with that exact same sentence? He is quite possibly the most biographed and mythologized person in the automotive canon. Invoking his name in any context adds a sense of gravitas to the situation, that suddenly this must be a big deal because the great Enzo Ferrari is involved. His story of familial loss and personality-driven success has been told and told again, and by making this video, no matter how hard I try, I'm only contributing to the mythos. But nonetheless, I'm going to attempt to use this opportunity not to work free of charge for Ferrari's marketing department, but to remind you that Enzo was not an omnipotent magician of gears and metal, you might say some kind of god from the machine, but a human being. Not only that, but possibly one of the most arrogant human beings to ever walk the earth, whose said arrogance caused him his own fair share of headaches over the years. Because if there's one thing guaranteed to bite you in the ass more than needlessly pissing off your contemporaries, it's needlessly pissing off your Italian contemporaries. Something something off of the fishes asleep they can't refuse, I don't fucking know. So, to the best of my ability, here is every time Enzo sowed the seeds of ego, disrespect and bitterness, and consequently reaped a crop of a rogues gallery of rivals. This is everyone Enzo Ferrari shouldn't have pissed off. Enzo Ferrari was a very highly strung gentleman. If you have any of the following symptoms, short temper, enacting your hatred upon the world, tremulous gut, or hysteria, you, like Enzo, may have a very serious case of boredom-induced stress. But worry not, there is a cure for this debilitating disease. Simply go to your doctor and ask them to prescribe you a hefty dose of World of Warships. World of Warships! Captain thousands of tons of faithfully rendered 20th century steel and blast your enemies to high heaven. And watch this up, my With day. over 40 different maps, you can torpedo your enemies next to jungle islands in a speedy destroyer. Dive bomb them under the searing desert sun from a colossal aircraft carrier. And of course, turn their hulls into Swiss cheese in the fjords of Norway with the colossal main batteries of a battleship. New content every month, including further additions to the game's 600 plus units unique ships means Enzo would never have gotten bored, and he would obviously have been truly delighted to discover this month's collaboration with the Anime High School Fleet. If you click the link in the description, download World of Warships, and sign up with the code HSF2023, you'll get a starter pack containing 200 doubloons, a million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and 2 High School Fleet commanders from the collaboration. Don't wait! Don't delay! Download World of Warships today! Do it! Download the game! I'm not asking! Do it now! Available on consoles and home computers. Interestingly, Ferrari's early career starts with him deliberately appeasing as many people as possible. Publicly, Enzo supported the Mussolini government, was a party member, and produced manufacturing equipment for the Italian war effort, while simultaneously letting socialist resistance fighters meet, organize, and even manufacture and repair weapons in his factory. Personally, I don't see this as a six-dimensional chess play of bringing down Mussolini from the inside, but rather Enzo covering his bases, getting in both sides good books should the war end one way or the other. One delightfully amoral money play that apparently came from this was the rumour that ball-bearing manufacturing machines bound for Germany made by Ferrari would mysteriously disappear en route as a result of raids by the socialists. This would then be returned to the Ferrari factory, issued new serial numbers, and sold to the Nazis again. In life, there's people that hustle. In life, there's people that grind. All this schmoozing paid off, and Ferrari was let off scot-free following the liberation of Italy from fascist rule. Evidently, though, Enzo decided he had kissed too many people's asses during the war, and with the tragic loss of his prodigal son Dino in 1956, likely taking any last fucks Enzo had to give, he chose violence for the rest of his life. This first manifested itself in what is known as the 1961 Palace Revolt. Ferrari, growing ever more headstrong, had begun to allow his wife Laura a bigger say in how the company was run. By most accounts, Laura had almost all of her husband's arrogance, with none of his technical ability and know-how, leading many of Enzo's most talented employees to raise the issue with the man himself. After a meeting that basically amounted to, You don't like my wife? Go fuck it yourself! 
eight of Ferrari's most high-ranking employees went on strike and hired a lawyer. Enzo promptly accused them of trying to start their own company and fired them, to which they responded by starting their own company. Out of these men, of particular note are Girolamo Gardini, the sales manager, Carlo Chitti, Ferrari's leading race car engineer, Giotto Bizzarini, designer of the legendary 250 GTO, and Romolo Tavoni, director of Ferrari's racing team Scuderia Ferrari. The six men would receive the financial backing of Count Giovanni Volpi di Miserata, the most Italian man who ever lived, and set to work developing race cars with one singular goal in mind. Beat Ferrari. For good measure, Bizzarini set up his own engineering company, called Soggetta Autostar, and was immediately commissioned by Renzo Revolta of Iso Auto Vecoli to design an elegant European Grand Tourer around the 5.4 litre V8 from a Corvette. The Iso Revolta debuted the following year in 1962. Possibly one of the greatest GTs ever made, the ESO combines European handling, style and comfort with brutish American power and torque with effortless grace. Furthermore, the racing version bore more than a striking resemblance to the 250 GTO that Bizzarini had also designed. Already, Enzo's arrogance was beginning to blow up in his face. Concurrently, a particular repeat Ferrari customer had fallen out of love with his modern and motors. He found them too loud, little more than repurposed race cars with little to tame them for the road, especially compared to his Jaguar and Mercedes. He took particular ire with the clutch, which constantly needed to be sent back to Modena for repairs and was a bitch to operate when it was working. Even when you've made millions, say for example by, I don't know, making and selling tractors, this kind of thing annoys you, so this man went to- Fuck, I, I, I can't keep this up. I know it's Lamborghini, you know it's Lamborghini, I know that you already know the story. I'm just gonna play it out as a Disco Elysium joke to spice things up. I have a solution. If you consider a partnership, Ferrari, Lamborghini, you make the best cars in the world. This bunk industrialist is questioning you about your cars? Give him a piece of your mind. Go back to your tractors, farmer. With his honor insulted, Ferruccio had but one course of action. Spiteful vengeance. As the Palace Revolt had been mainstream news, Ferruccio was more than aware of what the old Ferrari crew were up to, what their talents were, and how wanting they were for work. So while he was setting about founding a sports car arm of his company, he commissioned Sochetta Autostar to design an engine for him. By 1963, the Ferrari Slayers had completed two cars, a Formula One racer, the Tipo 100, and a quite revolutionary mid-engine touring car called the 2500 GT. One of them must have looked around and said, What, we some kind of touring and sport automobiles? Automobili Turismo e Sport would enter that year's Formula One championship having poached two of Ferrari's best drivers, Phil Hill and Giancarlo Baghetti, and failed miserably. Yeah, turns out if you develop a race car in only around a year, out of spite, while splitting your attention on another project, the resulting car turns out not to be the most reliable or competitive. But that didn't mean it was the end of the Ferrari Slayers. Meanwhile, the first ever Lamborghini was built, the prototype 350 GTV, which would evolve the following year into the production 350 GT. This is where it started. This is the car that marks the beginning of Lamborghini's ongoing success and uninterrupted run of classic supercar after classic supercar, with derivatives of Bizzarini's original 1963 design forming the backbone of Lamborghini's range until the end of the Murcia Lagos run in 2010. Such a legendary engine run is nigh on unparalleled. Needless to say, Bizzarini knocking it out of the park with the Lamborghini V12 must have haunted Enzo's dreams over the decades. But before Ferrari had time to think about that, also in 1963, he had something else on his mind. He'd grown tired of managing Ferrari's increasingly broad operations. At heart, he was a racer. Ferrari had only ever made road cars to fund its race team. So if he could find a buyer to outsource the road car production to, it would free him up to focus on what he had always wanted to do. So a message was sent to the Ford Motor Company with an offer to enter negotiations. Donald N. Frey led Ford's delegation to Europe and began drawing up the terms. 
Ford would buy 90% of Ferrari, forming a new Italian branch of the company called Ford Ferrari. Meanwhile, the racing team, known as Ferrari Ford, would be a mostly independent affair run by Enzo. It was that mostly that troubled Enzo, though. Ferrari Ford would be required to source its funding from Ford directly, and when asked, Frey confirmed that said funding would not be provided if Ferrari wanted to race at an event that Ford's own racing team were already present at. At this point, Enzo paused, took a deep breath, and told Frey and the rest of the delegation that they were mother eating sons of who took him for a dunce, had the honor of swine, and if they ever showed their ugly faces in Italy again, he'd break every rib in their body so they could their own even harder. Henry Ford II did not take this well and resolved to stick it to Ferrari. The Lola Mark VI, already a Ford powered mid engine Le Mans racer, was selected as the basis for the new car, and work began at Lola's workshop in, oh god, Slough, under the new subsidiary Ford Advanced Vehicles. Again, I know where this is going, you know where it's going, you've watched Ford v Ferrari, this is what led to the Ford GT40's domination of Le Mans. After two failed years, Ford would win Le Mans four times in a row from 1966 onwards, humiliatingly ending Ferrari's previously undefeated six-year run. This marked the start of a dark age for Ferrari's motorsport affairs, as not long after, the Ford UK-sponsored Cosworth DFV V8 took over Formula One like 2018 was taken over by this haircut. Furthermore, after the failure of ATS, Carlo Chitti took the 2.5 litre V8 he developed for the 2500 GT and turned it into the legendary Alfa Romeo Tipo 33 engine. Chitti would be made head engineer of Alfa Romeo's racing team, ironically just as Enzo had in the 30s, and continue to develop the 33, turning it into a formidable race car that eventually dominated the World Sports Car Championship in 1975 and 77. While Ferrari would keep at Formula One and remain a powerful force, 1965 would be Ferrari's last Le Mans win until this year, 58 years later. Finally, because in 1963 Ferrari decided he still hadn't pissed off enough people, he demanded that Ferrari's main dealer in Switzerland pay in advance for 100 cars, to which the dealer refused. Another man of self-conviction and vindication, and perhaps looking to get a head start by supplying supercars to his country's now Ferrari-less market, the dealer, one Peter Monteverdi, set about developing his own. Meanwhile, Bizzarini renamed Societa Autostar to Bizzarini and started making cars under his own name, reclothing the Iso Revolta in a more sporting getup and christening it the 5300 GT Strada. He also designed ESO's more performance-oriented car, the 1965 Grifo, however this car became a point of contention in the ESO Bizzarini partnership. Arguments over who owned the rights to the Grifo name resulted in the companies going separate ways before the Grifo was introduced. ESO would continue to work on the Grifo, eventually culminating in the IR9 Can-Am, which replaced the 5.4-litre Corvette engine with a truly monstrous 7.4-litre Chevy Big Block from the Chevelle SS, producing upwards of 450 horsepower. The resulting car was truly cartoonish, the smooth European curves interrupted by a colossal bonnet bulge containing the beast within. Monteverdi arrived on the scene two years after the Grifo with the High Speed 375, which indicated the amount of power produced by the car's enormous 7.2 litre Chrysler V8. God, I really need to bank up on some synonyms for big, I'm throwing them all away right now. Large. Later models of this car were completed with some of the most gorgeous, elegant coachwork ever fitted to a car, courtesy of Fasori. In 1970, the prototype High 450 would mount the legendary Chrysler 426 Hemi amidships, However, that tragically never made it past the prototype stage. Unfortunately, Bizzarini would reduce his operations mainly to prototypes from then on, and ESO would cease operations in the face of the early 70s oil crisis, with Monteverdi ceasing supercar production for the same reason not long after. But Bizzarini had already left his mark in setting up Lamborghini for the rampant success it still experiences. Likewise, the sales ESO and Monteverdi took away from Ferrari while they operated wouldn't have done him any good. And what makes it all so delicious is that he could have avoided it all. Had he not pissed off Lamborghini, Bizzarini, Kitty, Monteverdi, and Henry Ford II, he could have made life so, so much easier for himself. But he didn't, because he was a massive fucking dickhead. People try and forgive this in the grand narrative scheme of things, 
But if he hadn't told Lamborghini to go fuck himself, then we wouldn't have Lamborghini. Which, yes, is true. Never underestimate the creative and productive force of spite. But when the man is surrounded by such mythos and lauded as a deity, it bears reminding that when it comes down to it, he was an incredibly talented, arrogant, self-centered asshole. At least he seems to have learned his lesson by the end of the 60s. That's where the consequences of his own actions had started to manifest themselves, and where the legendary stories tend to stop. The obvious alternate history question to ask here is, what if Ferrari had never pissed these people off? Would we have got Lamborghini? How would Le Mans have been shaped by the absence of the GT40? How would Bizzarini and Keaty staying shape the company and the cars? Would Ferrari have been even more successful through a lack of rivals? Or are the stories of Lamborghini, the Palace Revolt and others crucial to the Ferrari mythos and therefore its brand image? Those are really big questions that can't be answered right now, so instead, I'll posit this. There's an alternate timeline starting from the late 60s where Enzo doesn't chill out and continues to be a vindictive, spite-inducing asshat. How many more people does he piss off? What great automotive stories have we missed out on? Hello, welcome to the end of the video. This is where I talk about things I wasn't quite able to fit into the script or somehow didn't feel right, but are still tangentially or maybe even more so directly related to the topic of the video. But before I go anywhere further, this is the first mainline video. I get to shout out my kind, generous, and of course, physically attractive patrons. Their names are on screen right now. Holy shit, you guys are incredible. Thank you so much. I can already sense the comments screaming at me. Where is Nikki Lauda? Yes, I know. Nikki Lauda, if you don't know, you should. Ridiculously famous Formula One driver, had a lot of success with Ferrari, later got pissed off by Ferrari, moved to Formula One teams that weren't Ferrari, and won Formula One again, so obviously not very good for Ferrari's Formula One endeavors. It didn't quite feel right putting that in the main body of the video because Enzo and Nicky Lauda always hated each other. It was just going to be a matter of time before something set off the firework and Nicky Lauda moved away to a different F1 team. All the other examples are where Enzo seemingly goes out of his way to deliberately piss someone off or insult them, which later then came back to bite him in the ass. Like I said, Nicky Lauda and Enzo, it just sort of seemed inevitable. They never got on, they always hated each other, it was just going to be a matter of time. So, for that reason, I'm putting Nicky Lauda here, rather than in the main body of the video. Besides that, if there are any examples I missed, please feel free to let me know, talk about them, discuss in the comments. Uh, that's why we're here. History, learning, education. With that, I'd like to thank my friends Carol, Harv, and CJ for being present for test screenings of this video. Snurf knocking it out of the park again with, I think, the best thumbnail they've ever done. This one's incredible. And with that, I don't think there's anything else much to talk about. Thank you very much for watching. Bye bye The program you just watched was sponsored by World of Warships. Please check for the promotional code in the description.